Ridley Scott, welcome to 7.30. Thank you, Deb. Napoleon was reviled as a tyrant in England, where you're from, and revered as a hero in France, where you live a lot of the time. What was he to you, hero or villain? Well, it is a quick answer. There's two and a half thousand books written about him. Uh, one book for every week since his death. Can you believe it? So clearly he is fascinating uh, and fascinated historians and authors for 200 years. Um, I think he's such a, a multifaceted character, both good and dark, bad and evil, regarded in every which way. So he, he's an, a true enigma. You said before that it was watching Joaquin Phoenix in The Joker that made you think he was right for Napoleon. What is it that you saw? Well, remember, I'd done a film called Gladiator way before that. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the North. And I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. So I went for Joachim as the Prince of Rome. And of course, people tend to be very on the nose in Hollywood. I think it's fair to say, is that a polite way of saying it? Um, and they said, what? This guy, but he's small and... I said, this is the Prince of Rome. This is who we want. In many respects, Joachim was a very sympathetic character, even though he had all the trappings of evil behavior in the film. I never forgot how he handled that because he's got this wonderful double edge of his power is his, you feel, always feel sorry for him. And that's his, that's his charm. Napoleon obviously had a vast life. You've given us the story of the ambitious military commander and the lover of Josephine. You've left out the part of his life where he transformed France. Why did you make those choices? When you're doing something of this scale, you have to choose your moments and say what you need to say to cover what could be an hour's work. So part of the skill of writing is to isolate what you need to say and move on. I found the crown of France in the gutter. I picked it up with the tip of my sword and place it atop my own head. You've got to keep people interested with a little bit of action, real battles, and of course, I think the fuel of the film is his relationship with Josephine. I wondered whether you'd ever considered calling the film Napoleon and Josephine because the vortex pull of that relationship in the film is so strong. Let's have a look. You want to be great? Hmm? You are nothing without me. You are just a brute that is nothing without me. She evolved as we, as I was kind of constant state of rewriting and readjusting. And when I, I'd, I'd work with, you know, my, my gal who does do Josephine before, once before I'd been a producer on one of my TV shows, probably almost uh, 12, 15 years ago. She was very young and I always remembered her. Then I watched her surface on The Crown. And I thought, The Crown is probably one of the best TV series ever done, in my opinion. Um, and when she took, did part of Princess Margaret, I thought she was marvelous. She had this, this, you know, this royal kind of persona, kind of interesting. I want to talk about the epic battle scenes in the film. Now, you're using a lot of cameras in the field rather than relying on CGI for everything. Why did you make that choice? I had a marvellous CGI man, Charlie Henley, and, but, you know, there's a, a logic. If I'm going to do makeup, hair, wardrobe, more than 400 soldiers in the morning, everyone gets in at 4 a.m. And there's 50 dressers, so the economics start to not make sense. So I draw the line at 400, so I'm looking along a line. Can you see my hand? Yes. Uh, 400 men, 
It's about 200 meters. Everything beyond that going stretching for almost a mile is Charlie. And that's the same for horses. When you come around the front, it gets more difficult. It's really how you shoot it and put it in the camera. Then that, that becomes the, the basis. Then Charlie adds to it. I want to ask a question about you. How does one family produce two great film directors? That's you and your late brother, Tony Scott. How much did your mother's love of movies have to do with it? Well, well my mum definitely loved movies. And I remember in the war years, my dad was in the war office, so he was frequently away. But there's a moment we lived in Ealing. And my mum used to go and have afternoon tea at a Lions Corner House and take me and my elder brother there. Then I always remember being taken, I think the first film I ever saw, funny enough, was called Gilda. Rita Hayworth. And I'll never forget Rita Hayworth taking her glove off and doing a strip tease with the glove, saying, put the blame on Mame. Ah, that, that, to me, that was the beginning of cinema. You had one very famous, terrible moment in your career in cinema when Hollywood decided to give the sequel to one of your greatest movies, Alien, to another director, Jim Cameron, without telling you. Did you ever forgive Hollywood for that? Dude, I was fired twice on Blade Runner. I, I, and by the time I go to Hollywood, I'm 41. I'm quite well off. I'm on my second Rolls Royce by then. Um, and so I've already got no pay for the duelists. I did it because I could afford to do it. Um, I then was got Alien, which was formidably... Uh, a milestone, I think, in science fiction horror. And then I then moved on to Blade Runner. And then the first th th time I realized they're doing Alien 2 was Jim called me. Jim's a sweetheart, nice man. And he said, hey, it's going to be difficult for you. He said, your alien was so such a unique creature. It can never be as frightening again because it's been seen. So I'm going to go military. What do you think? I went... Really? I didn't know he was going to direct him. Well, whatever setback that was... It wasn't a setback. You know, you just... Welcome to Hollywood. Welcome to Hollywood, indeed. Ridley Scott, thank you very much for joining us and for giving us all this beautiful epic to cheer us all up. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That's nice.